Today I'm going to talk about a design approach that I created called Freedom and Constraint Topologies or FACT that I've since adapted to enable the design of architected materials. Architected materials achieve their properties not so much from what material they're made of, but how they are structured. Consider for example this lattice. When it is compressed, regardless of what material it's made of, instead of bulging outward like most natural materials would, its sides pull inward with a negative Poisson's ratio behavior due to how the unit cell's topology is structured. Architected materials can thus be engineered to achieve combinations of properties that would otherwise not be possible to achieve using traditional, homogeneous, or all-solid materials. If this lattice were made of aluminum, its performance capabilities would span far into the white space regions of this Young's modulus versus Poisson's ratio Ashby plot. There are currently two categories of approaches for designing architected materials, analytical approaches and computational approaches. Most analytical approaches require designers to apply their experience and motion visualization capabilities to generate simple compliant mechanisms that can be used within periodic lattices to achieve desired properties and can be parameterized and optimized using analytical equations. Other, more systematic approaches use computation exclusively to generate architected materials. Topology optimization, for example, typically begins with a random mixture of materials that are then randomly changed from one iteration to the next using a genetic algorithm. If the changes help the resulting material more closely achieve its desired properties, the changes are kept. If, however, the changes hurt the behavior, the changes are discarded. In this way, a final design evolves from one iteration to the next until the solver settles on a design within the nearest local minimum. But what if it is desired to design a hierarchical architected material that consists of one periodic design within another? Or what if an aperiodic design is desired that has no repeating unit cell but irregularly changes over its entire geometry like natural bone? Such designs would not be possible to generate using existing approaches since computational resources are not sufficient to even store the immense amount of information currently required to manage such complex designs, let alone optimize or search their infinite design spaces. A new disruptive design approach is thus required that can address these critical issues. I created the Freedom and Constraint Topologies or FACT design approach 16 years ago, initially with the objective of simply enabling the design of compliant mechanisms and precision flexure systems, but since being a professor at UCLA, I've extended its capabilities to enable the design of all systems that deform, including architected materials. FACT utilizes a comprehensive library of geometric shapes that represent the mathematics of screw theory. One set of shapes, shown as red, green, and black lines, are called freedom spaces, and they represent all the ways a compliant system can freely deform with high compliance. Another set of complementary shapes, shown as blue lines, are called constraint spaces, and they represent the region of space within which flexible constraints can be placed to achieve the motions of their complementary freedom space. As an example, consider this freedom space that consists of a single rotation. Its constraint space is every plane that intersects the rotation line's axis. Thus, any compliant mechanism that achieves a single rotation, like the three mechanisms shown here, will do so because their flexible constraints lie on the intersecting planes of the rotation line's constraint space. And since FACT's library of geometric shapes is comprehensive, FACT embodies the complete design space of all deformable systems. I've created the rules for rapidly combing through the most promising branches of this complete design space to enable designers to rapidly identify the most promising compliant solutions that achieve particular functional requirements. To understand how FACT can be applied to the design of architected materials, it's important that I first teach a short mini-tutorial about its fundamental principles. All 3D objects that are not constrained possess six degrees of freedom, three rotations and three translations. These degrees of freedom can be eliminated by attaching flexible constraints to the object. The simplest flexible constraint is a wire flexure. Wire flexures stiffly constrain bodies along their axes while freely allowing compliant deformations in all other directions. We can thus model such wires as blue constraint lines that are only capable of resisting motions along their axes. 
It was James Clerk Maxwell that first recognized that each non-redundant constraint added to a body removes one of its six degrees of freedom. Thus, he introduced the equation six minus the number of non-redundant constraint lines equals the number of degrees of freedom. Consider the following example which demonstrates this equation. The mechanism stage is constrained by two wire flexures, and thus, according to Maxwell's equation, we would expect the mechanism to achieve four degrees of freedom, which it does. Its four degrees of freedom are shown animated here using modal analysis. If we added a third wire to the system, it would eliminate the single translation label 2 as shown here. If we added a different third wire to the system, it would eliminate the single rotation label 3 as shown here. But what if we added another third wire to the system that is parallel to the other two wires and also lies on the same plane? Modal analysis reveals that the resulting system is largely unaffected in that it still achieves the original four degrees of freedom. But it's confusing because six minus three does not equal four. Does this mean that Maxwell's equation is wrong? No, Maxwell said that six minus the number of non-redundant constraints is the number of degrees of freedom. The third wire we added is redundant. That means it does the same thing as the other two wires in the system. In other words, if you add or subtract the third wire, it doesn't affect the system's kinematics or changes degrees of freedom. Redundantly constrained systems are said to be over-constrained. But what is the relationship between flexible constraints and their permitted degrees of freedom? Let's look at another example to find out. Consider this system with two grounded bodies and one rigid stage. Since its stage is constrained by five wire flexures, we know that the system will achieve a single degree of freedom since six minus five is one. But what is the single degree of freedom? Well, modal analysis reveals that the system can rotate about a single axis shown here as a red rotation line. The rule that dictates the relationship between red rotation lines and generally oriented blue constraint lines is called the rule of complementary patterns. This rule says that every rotation line intersects every constraint line somewhere at least once. For this example, you can see that the red rotation line does indeed intersect two of the blue constraint lines on the stage's top face and the same rotation line is also parallel to the other three constraint lines, which means that they all intersect at a point infinitely far away. It's true. Despite what you likely learned in kindergarten, parallel lines do intersect, they just intersect at infinity. Since the red rotation line shown is the only line that intersects all five constraint lines somewhere at least once, it is the only permissible motion that the system can achieve. Now let's apply the rule of complementary patterns to identify the permissible motions of a multi-degree of freedom system. This system consists of three wire flexures and thus its stage should achieve three degrees of freedom because six minus three is three. So can you visualize what those three degrees of freedom are? Well, let's draw the constraint lines through the axis of the wire flexures and then apply the rule of complementary patterns to identify the system's permissible rotation lines. We can then hide the stage and ground and show only the constraint lines on their planes so that the geometric relationship between the blue lines is more clearly identifiable. Upon inspection, it becomes clear that all the red rotation lines within a disk that lies on the horizontal plane intersect all three blue constraint lines somewhere at least once, either in finite space or at infinity when the lines are parallel. Moreover, all the red rotation lines within another disk on the vertical plane also satisfy the same conditions. Thus, the system can freely deform about any of the red rotation lines within these two disks. If you have a hard time visualizing these deformations, consider these three red rotation line examples from the space of infinite permissible motions. Note that no other red rotation lines intersect all three of the system's blue constraint lines somewhere at least once, and thus these two disks of rotation lines constitute the system's freedom space. A system's freedom space visually depicts its complete kinematics. In other words, in a single picture, the freedom space portrays all the ways a mechanism can freely deform with high compliance. But remember that according to Maxwell's equation, a system with three constraints like this one should only possess three degrees of freedom. So why then did we find an infinite number of permissible rotation lines? Well, you already know that when a body achieves two translational degrees of freedom, the body can also translate in a different direction on the plane of the translations as a result of their combined effort. In fact, a system that possesses two translational degrees of freedom can translate in any direction as depicted by this disk of translation shown here. Thus, although the body achieves an infinite number of permissible translations, only two of those motions are independent and the body is said to achieve two degrees of freedom.
Similarly, although the system of our example can achieve an infinite number of rotations within the two disks of its freedom space, only three of them are independent and thus the system is said to have three degrees of freedom. But since we found all the red rotation lines that intersect all the blue constraint lines, it begs the question, are there other blue constraint lines that intersect all the red rotation lines that we haven't found, and if so, what is their significance? Let's again dispense with the system stage and ground to more clearly see the geometric relationship between the system's relevant red and blue lines. Upon closer inspection, it's clear to see that there is an infinite number of blue constraint lines within a disk on the vertical plane that intersect all the red rotation lines in both red disks, and there is a similar disk of blue constraint lines on the horizontal plane that satisfies the same conditions. The infinite blue lines within those two disks constitute all the lines that satisfy the rule of complementary patterns. But what is their significance? Well, you of course notice that the first three wire flexures possess constraint lines that lie within that space, but what if we added an additional three wire flexures to the system that also lie within the space? Would those new constraints remove or change any degrees of freedom? No, since their constraint lines still intersect all the same red rotation lines and satisfy the rule of complementary patterns. Thus, the three new wire flexures that we added to the system are redundant constraints that overconstrain the system. Thus, the space of all blue constraint lines represent all the ways a system can be overconstrained by redundant constraints and is called a system's constraint space. Moreover, a system's constraint space visually depicts all the possible designs that would achieve the degrees of freedom of its complementary freedom space. This idea is very powerful from a design perspective since there is a unique one-to-one -one mapping between a freedom space and its complementary constraint space. Any system that is constrained with flexible elements that lie within the constraint space will move with the motions within its freedom space, and any system that is intended to achieve the motions within the freedom space must possess a topology that lies within its complementary constraint space. Moreover, according to Maxwell's equation, if the freedom space possesses r degrees of freedom, you know you need to pick 6 minus r, or C non-redundant constraints within its constraint space to successfully achieve the desired compliant deformations. It's thus clear how this knowledge would be important to design systems that are intended to achieve a freedom space of interlocking red rotation disks. But what if you wanted to design a system that was intended to achieve a different combination of permissible motions? It seems that there would be an infinite number of freedom spaces since there are an infinite number of compliant mechanism design possibilities. But the amazing thing is that there is not an infinite number of freedom constraint space pairs. In fact, there are only 26 and they can all be organized in columns within this comprehensive library that corresponds to the number of degrees of freedom represented within their freedom spaces. You'll note that the freedom space of the previous example is shown in the three degrees of freedom column of this library of spaces, but it's depicted with additional green screw lines that were not previously shown in the freedom space. The reason is that I haven't yet shown you how to identify a system's screw motions. But now you're ready to understand how the FACT approach can be used to design traditional compliant mechanisms. Suppose we wanted to design a compliant mechanism with a stage that is intended to achieve three orthogonal rotation lines that intersect at the stage's tip as shown here. To design the system, we need only refer to the three degree of freedom column of the FACT library to identify which freedom space contains the three desired intersecting rotations there are only nine options. It should be clear to see that the freedom space that contains these rotations is the sphere of all red rotation lines that intersect the same point. Its complementary constraint space is also a sphere of blue constraint lines. Thus, we know that to achieve the desired three degrees of freedom, the final design will have to also achieve the resulting combinations of all those degrees of freedom in the form of every permissible rotation line that intersects the stage tip as depicted by the system's freedom space. We also know that, that the design must lie within the system's constraint space, which is a sphere of blue constraint lines. We also know from Maxwell's equation that we must select three non-redundant constraint lines to constrain the system's stage since six minus three degrees of freedom is three constraints. By selecting any more than three constraint lines, the system would be overconstrained by redundant constraints. For this example, we select the three wire flexures shown. Note that the resulting system achieves the desired degrees of freedom, and we didn't ever even need to consider what material the system would be made of, or determine the geometry of the stage and ground, or even specify how long or thick the wire flexures should be.
FACT was able, with its ideal constraint assumptions, to determine a promising topology, i.e. determine a viable number, kind, location, and orientation of flexible constraints that would achieve the desired functional requirements almost without performing any calculations at all. It is because of these simplified but powerful assumptions that enable FACT to design complex, irregular, and even aperiodic architectured materials with multiple orders of magnitude more efficiently than could otherwise be achieved using other state-of-the-art computational design alternatives. That said, I'm now ready to show you how FACT can be used to design architected materials. Suppose you wanted to design a material that is intended to occupy the cubic volume shown and achieve the same three intersecting rotations of the previous example. To generate an architected design solution, we must first divide the material into unit cells. In this case, we choose a very coarse resolution of 4 by 4 by 4 unit cells. We then identify the system's freedom space and constraint space pair, which is of course the same freedom and constraint space pair of the previous example. Using the system's constraint space, we should then identify what portions of the space intersect the unit cell being synthesized. The appropriate number of wires, which in this case is three, should be selected according to Maxwell's equation, and these wires should join two rigid bodies together as shown. If this process is repeated for every unit cell within the lattice, the entire architected material can be generated such that it achieves the three intersecting rotations. Now I recognize that if you are clever enough, you could likely have designed this example without using fact. But suppose you wanted to design a material that achieved a single screw degree of freedom that twisted when you compressed or stretched it with a certain pitch value P. This single green screw freedom space is easily identified in the one degree of freedom column of the fact library. Its constraint space consists of blue constraint lines that lie within disks and circular hyperboloids according to the equation P equals D multiplied by tangent theta, where P is the screw's pitch, D is the shortest distance between the green screw line and each blue constraint line, and theta is the screw angle between the green screw line and each blue constraint line. Thus, when selecting wire flexures from within the screw's constraint space, each wire's constraint line must satisfy this equation. Note that due to Maxwell's equation, at least five wires should be selected per unit cell since six minus one degrees of freedom is five constraints. If this process is repeated for all the cells within the top layer of the material, a design that looks something like this may be generated. Note that due to symmetry, only six unique cell designs were necessary. For this example, each layer was repeated to generate a design that successfully produced the desired screw degree of freedom. We wrote a MATLAB software tool which generates architected materials that can achieve any desired combination of degrees of freedom. The software first asks users to specify how many unit cells are wanted and how large the unit cells should be. The second step asks users to interact with the FACT library to select what degrees of freedom are wanted and how they are located and oriented. In the demo shown here, the desired degrees of freedom are two orthogonal intersecting rotations and two orthogonal translations positioned on the center of the material's top surface. The third step is simply to click the Generate Design button, and within seconds a design is produced that successfully achieves the desired degrees of freedom. The software generates mode shape animations to confirm that the material designed correctly achieves its intended degrees of freedom. Finally, the software produces an STL file of the generated design so that the file can be uploaded to a variety of 3D printers where the design can then be fabricated. Using this software tool, we were able to determine that the simplified mathematics that underlie the FACT approach was six orders of magnitude more computationally efficient than other state-of-the-art computational alternative approaches. To generate a 20 by 20 by 20 unit cell aperiodic material, 8,000 unique three-dimensional cell designs were generated with a total of 32,000 wire flexures in under 132 seconds. Although all the design examples up to this point have been serially stacked designs that consist of wire flexures exclusively and achieve desired directions of compliance, FACT can be used to achieve architected materials that achieve any mechanical property and consist of flexible geometries of any shape that are configured in any way desired. Examples include transmission-based mechanisms like this negative Poisson's ratio material and thermally actuated materials like this tunable thermal expansion coefficient design. If you are interested to learn more about FACT, I encourage you to check out my educational YouTube channel that I launched during the pandemic. The channel is called The Facts of Mechanical Design 
and consists of professionally edited videos about compliant mechanisms and architected materials. And with that, I acknowledge my group's research sponsors and am grateful for my amazing students who make all this happen. Thank you for your attention.